It's a great privilege to, uh, to be here and discuss with you uh, how the results of CORE 320 are bound to influence clinical practice. They are influencing already in several parts of the world. And um, as Dr. Neiman mentioned, I function as the principal investigator for the, for the CORE 320 uh, study, which is funded by Toshiba Medical Center, Medical Systems. And um, I would like to um, just first approach with you why, why to do the, uh, why this trial is, is important. Uh, years ago, when drug eluding stents were uh, discovered, uh, we thought that basically the problem with coronary artery disease was uh, fundamentally addressed, that it was the obstruction in the coronary artery that was the problem, and drug eluding stents uh, would solve it. Since then, we have learned uh, through many, many sources of data that that's not the case, that um, um, we not only need to identify uh, the obstructive lesion, but the obstructive lesion that is causing ischemia, measured either by dysfunction, by echocardiography, or by a perfusion defect. And this is one of those studies that showed us um, that, uh, measuring it with invasive FFR. But uh, the, the baseline concept is that it is the, the functional stenosis that, uh, that matters. And this is the paradigm that we use at Hopkins. Um, patients with low risk or intermediate risk uh, have a CT uh, angiography first. Those who are positive, those who are negative are discharged to home. But those who are positive have a stress test. And um, in the US, the SPECT um, stress test is the most common, although we at Hopkins also use uh, stress echo uh, commonly as well. If the patient has a definite ACS by ECG, it's, as mentioned before, it's easy to recognize and the pathway is clear. The question revolves around patients uh, in this area with intermediate risk or high risk, and um, if they are uh, uh, biomarker positive, they generally follow the revascularization route, but if they are biomarker <laughs> negative, they are tested. And uh, we thought that it would be extremely useful if we could combine these two procedures because uh, would shorten and uh, not only the, the workup, uh, but it could make it much more precise at identifying exactly which lesions need to be addressed. And that's why the CORE 320 study was, was performed. Its primary hypothesis was to um, see if we could, through a combination of CT angiography and CT perfusion, match uh, that three-dimensional model that we construct in our heads uh, when you, we are in clinical practice uh, by combining the results of the invasive angiography with the results of the SPECT imaging. So that's a, a model that we construct in our heads and we wanted uh, the question that we addressed was can we do this with uh, CT uh, technology. So the main uh, objectives were to evaluate the diagnostic performance of combined CTA and CTP to identify patients who would have this flow limiting uh, uh, lesion that we know should be addressed by revascularization or aggressive medical therapy, depending on the clinical setting, of course. And uh, we committed ourselves to also uh, perform a per vessel diagnostic accuracy. The um, inclusion criteria were patients 45 to 85 who had chest pain, had been referred to uh, cardiac catheterization, and um, the exclusion criteria, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but highlight that patients with a BMI over 40 um, meters per kilogram square were excluded. This is the study design. So in the US or in, in uh, uh, areas where the SPECT is generally part of the algorithm that leads uh, the patient to have a, a referral to angiography, we included that uh, SPECT as part of the study if it was done in a validated lab within 60 days of patient presentation. 
in that case, that was considered to be the, the SPEC study, and the CTA CTP was the perfusion uh, was the research uh, uh, component of the study before invasive coronary angiography. Now, in those parts of the world and in which the SPECT is generally not used in that uh, evaluation algorithm, then SPECT was also part of the research protocol before the patient had CTA, CTP, and before the patient had invasive angiography. The CT methods have been published in detail, and um, after preparation, we do calcium score, we did a rest CTA, and then five minutes later, we started adenosine, an infusion, as if you were doing a, a, a nuclear study, and four minutes later, we injected adenosine, uh, we inject contrast again, and we repeated pretty much the CTA protocol with some uh, uh, differences that uh, are detailed in this, in this paper. The data was analyzed in completely blinded uh, uh, fashion in two core labs, the angiographic data, the CT angio and the uh, invasive uh, angio and the CT angio were. Uh, and one of the challenges, of course, that we had to relate the angio information to the perfusion information is exactly which vessel perf uh, perfuses which area of the heart. This appears to be intuitive, and we all use it in clinical practice, but when you're trying to uh, make it systematic, it's actually much more complex than that. And this is a paper that Dr. Rodrigo Cerci published uh, relating uh, exactly how we did that in, in Core 320. And the perfusion uh, labs were also completely blinded. The, the, MPI, SPECT MPI lab was at the Brigham, and the CT perfusion lab was uh, at Hopkins. Uh, the statistical analysis was done at the School of Public Health, and the area under the curve was chosen as the primary en uh, en endpoint for the study. This was the, the study organization, and you saw uh, my colleague, Dr. Kofoad, who spoke uh, before me, uh, was the PI of the Ricks uh, Hospital at, uh, Center in Denmark. Uh, we had a group of cardiologists and radiologists uh, that performed this study jointly. Uh, the core labs are uh, listed here, and we were monitored by a data safety and monitoring board uh, chaired by Dr. Warren Lasky, who's uh, a, a chair of cardiology at uh, New Mexico. Uh, this was the enrollment chart. Uh, you can see that enrollment was led by Dr. Rashid and his group at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, followed by Dr. Arai and Chan in the National Institutes of, of Health at NIH in Bethesda, and uh, Dr. Dewey and his group in Humboldt in, in Charité. Uh, this protocol was very difficult, I can tell you, because we were part of it, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, the study resulted from a lot of effort from a lot of people. Now, from the beginning, we thought, uh, should we include everybody? Should we include everybody with calcification? Should we include people with, with stents? And uh, there was a lot of discussion in the steering committee, so we committed ourselves to analyze the data uh, with everybody, uh, all comers, except patients with prior bypass uh, surgery. But everybody uh, was included in Core 320, and then analyzed patients only uh, that did not have a history of CAD. And I'll show you the results. So if we start with those patients, patients who didn't have a history of CAD, you can see here a typical data set of an occlusion of the LAD with a, an anterior perfusion defect. Um, so that was a match uh, and uh, on the gold standard side. And that corresponded to a match on the uh, CTA side because there is an occlusion of the LAD with a perfusion defect by CTP. So that's a data set on somebody without the previous histories of uh, uh, CAD. Now here's someone who has had a stent seen here in the, in the LAD with a large perfusion defect <coughs> by SPECT, uh, same stent seen by CTA, with a perfusion defect by CTP. So it's also a uh, match in both uh, sides of the, of the study. Now, so there was agreement. 
Um, here's another example of agreement because there was a mismatch, a lesion um, in the uh, RCA that did not cause a perfusion defect uh, on SPECT and a lesion seen in the CTA that did not cause a perfusion defect uh, by CT perfusion. So that also was uh, a match. But we had uh, situations that in the study were uh, read as false uh, negatives because there was a positive, uh, uh, a positive match with a lesion in the LAD and a perfusion defect by SPECT, and yet, even though we found a lesion by CTA, there was not a perfusion defect uh, by CTP. But the most common situation was actually exemplified here in this uh, patient who entered the study uh, at age 80 with a typical uh, angina, uh, risk factors, and uh, was therefore referred for cath, and has here a lesion in the, uh, uh, in the LAD, proximal, uh, very uh, tight looking, and uh, yet had normal perfusion, um, and you can see the images are actually better on stress than at rest. And uh, uh, so in the gold standard side, it was a mismatch because there was a lesion and no perfusion defect. And yet on the case study, we did see a lesion by CTP, which was, by CTA, which was read as a, a significant lesion, and then a significant perfusion defect read by CTP. So in this case, um, which, uh, so there was a positive match and uh, the, the, the image set is, is shown here. This was actually more common. In other words, uh, that the CTP was positive in instances in which the SPECT was negative. And we had seen that in other studies and in studies that correlate CTP with MRI perfusion, there is a better correlation than with uh, SPECT imaging, um, signifying that this uh, technique may be more sensitive, but we don't know yet what is, uh, and that's what we'll uh, uh, find out as by applying it, uh, what is this, the actual significance uh, of that in terms of prognosis. In, um, so if we summarize the data, there was a clear increment in the ROC curve uh, by CT perfusion in relation to CT angiography. This is data for all vessels, but it was uh, even more striking for the LAD, but similar to the LCX and the right. So that if you were taking all comers, the ROC to have in mind is 0.87. That is, if you include patients with stents, history of infarct, um, and history of previous coronary artery disease, if you exclude patients with infarct, the ROC actually increases to 0 0.90. And if you exclude patients with cor uh, coronary artery disease altogether, the ROC is actually 0.93. That is, um, with this method, with this combined method, you, you have robust power to differentiate between patients who have a lesion with a corresponding perfusion defect versus those who don't, uh, who don't have that correspondence. So that's the importance of, uh, uh, of CORE 320. And uh, we are, of course, following these patients. This is the 30-day follow-up. If you take people who had revascularization, both techniques appear to identify those patients with equal power. And um, the radiation issue, which is, of course, a concern of ours, and we were monitored very closely for radiation. Uh, the radiation uh, was very similar for the entire CT. Here's for calcium score, the CTA, the CTP. The total radiation was 9.3 millisieverts compared to 9.7 on the SPEC side. So it was very similar in, in this regard. So we, are, we think that in the future, this uh, technology, um, and actually is already being used in, in many places, uh, will allow the cardiologist to first look for a calcium score. If the coronary is a normal, then it's a, a, uh, a clear situation that uh, you have a very good prognosis 
if the coronaries are questionable, uninterpretable, if there are lesions that you wonder if they're positive or negative, then these are the patients that perfusion will be indicated. And in our experience, this will be about a third. At Hopkins, it will be about a fourth to a third of the patients. So a very uh, a few uh, of, of these patients will indeed uh, have to go uh, for perfusion, and that this could all be done in 30 minutes. So that if you look now at that diagram that we started, we think or we hope that the paradigm shift will be that um, as somebody uh, has CT and geography and proves to have a lesion, or the study is not completely interpretable, that CT stress perfusion will be performed then, and the decision will be made from, from that standpoint. The results of CORE 320 suggest that even patients with higher risk for ACS or uh, higher risk for uh, uh, needing revascularization can be studied through this route if they are biomarker negative and if clinically indicated. I would like to finish by highlighting that this is a joint effort, as I told you, with 16 hospitals in the world. And um, uh, at Hopkins specifically, uh, faculty um, and, and colleagues, industrial partners um, that have put a lot of effort in this development are also uh, involved in mentoring uh, a large number of trainees. And here's uh, a, a list of them, some radiologists, some cardiologists, and I mentioned the work of Dr. Rodrigo Cerci in uh, matching vessels and territories. Thank you.